Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Welcome to Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction's official podcast. I'm Razia Iqbal, journalist, broadcaster and your host for today. In order to celebrate its 25th anniversary, the Bailey Gifford Prize is exploring its rich history. Today, my distinguished guests are three former winners of the prize, each of whom has written brilliantly about life under a dictatorship. Author and historian Michael Burley was only the third recipient of the prize when he won back in 2001 for his book, The Third Reich, an in-depth study of Nazi Germany. In 2010, the journalist Barbara Demick received the prize for Nothing to Envy, a poignant portrayal of people living in the notoriously secretive North Korean state. Last but not least, Frank Dakota, historian and author, won the 2011 prize with Mao's Great Famine, where he explored the horrifying reality of life during a particularly turbulent period in communist China's history. We are immensely grateful to the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its generous sponsorship of this podcast. Thank you all for making time to join us today. Let's start by getting each of you to clarify what we mean by the term dictatorship. What are the qualities that define dictatorships? Barbara Demick, let's start with you. Um, well, I, I, I will be um, immodest here and think that I had the leviathan of all dictatorships, North Korea. Um, and, you know, in this case, it was, um, you know, not only the inability to speak, the inability to move freely, but in the, the inability to think at all. Um, people were, I think, more cut off from the outside world than um, anywhere else, you know, maybe in recent history. And, you know, my, my book was an attempt to get inside the mindset of people in that environment. I, I wrote not so much about the character of the dictatorship as um, about the people living underneath it. Frank Dakota, what what about you? When in in looking at the the Great Leap and the the famine that killed forty five million people, I mean, it is staggering to even say that figure now. But t- tell us what you think in the context of what you are looking at. What what defines a, an an autocracy, a dictatorship? Well, the the context for me is the twentieth century, and for me, dictatorship uh, is a uh, is a principle which prizes a monopoly of power in opposition to other systems, uh, which very much pursue the separation of powers. In other words, freedom of speech, independent judicial system, you name it. So the idea of a monopoly of a power really comes, uh, well, it's old, but very much stems from Lenin. So in fact, what you have in North Korea, of course, uh, after 45, but also in China after 49, is that Lenin's principle of a monopoly of a power. Now, what happens when you hand over power to a single party? In fact, you hand, all the, you hand it over to a single man. And then that entire country must at some point start following every whim of this particular person. Uh, in, in my case, of course, Chairman Mao. And his idea is that you can just jump forward from uh, socialism into communism uh, if you pretty much turn every man and every woman in the countryside, hundreds of millions of people, into foot soldiers in one giant army that will work day and night to achieve that great leap forward. Well, the result is, of course, a disaster, uh, an un- un- parallel disaster in the 20th century with at least 45 million people not just starved to death, but sometimes also beaten to death because they don't follow orders. It's arguable, and as you do argue in, in, in your book, Michael, that National Socialism was a political religion with, with Hitler as this messiah figure. And, and, and clearly, I mean, I'd like you to say something about that, but, but there are overlaps with, with both Mao and with the North Korean state and the leadership in, in North Korea. So, 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 Michael, first, let's just hear a little bit about, about National Socialism as, as a religion. Okay, well, 
I think I think one should bear in mind a, a subtle distinction between religion, which could after all mean something like Buddhism or Jainism or whatever with a sophisticated intellectual uh, hinterland, um, and what you might call religiosity, which is the sort of uh, emotional um, uh, surroundings of uh, religion without actually, you don't really need any belief system. I mean, Nazism wasn't a serious belief system. It was just a sort of postmodernistic mashup, a bit like Putinism. But I think there are two things which I, in retrospect, I think are important to me in the book. One is the extreme ethno-sentimentalism of the Nazis. You know, they really did regard the Germans as the chosen people. And then secondly, something I talk about a lot in the book throughout, is their ambition of moral reconstruction. And I remember very vividly still a report by the exiled Social Democratic Party who said that it resembled if you were a commuter sitting on a train going over a bridge and you're reading your newspaper and they're repairing the... or not repairing the bridge, replacing it, and you just go by and you don't really notice that they're putting in a new bolt or this, that and the other, a new rail. But by the time a few months have gone by, you, you do notice you're going over an entirely different bridge. And like a lot of totalitarian movements in the past, including the Jacobins, who I've worked on in another book I wrote, um, there is a real attempt to, to make a new kind of man. I mean, something the Soviets obviously did in spades to create a new type of moral human being or not quasi-human being. And those are the things that really interested me in the sense of political religion. But Barbara Demick... Uh... Kim Jong-il, um, at the time in which you were writing the book, of course, has demigod status. So, so there is there is this overlap, this idea that, that being a dictator also involves presenting yourself as some sort of saviour. Uh, yes, exactly. I think the North Korean regime did have a complete um, belief system, maybe a, a, a mashup of... Um, you know, stolen elements of Christianity. But one thing that was quite interesting, and I think maybe distinctive about the North Koreans, although as I'm saying it, I'm thinking about well, the communists did the same thing, is their their antipathy to religion, not for religion itself, but they, they did not want any competition from other belief systems. So the, the, the most banned book in North Korea has always been the the Christian Bible because the North Koreans had borrowed so many elements um, from Christianity. Again, you know, about the Messiah, the the um, the star that heralded the belief of Kim Jong-il, the, the double rainbows, all this, um, you know, mystical um, symbolism, you know, really, really plagiarized from the Bible. And, you know, that remains to this day, it's, um, you know, easier to bring pornography into North Korea than a Bible. The Bible is the real threat. It, it, extraordinary. It just just to hear you say that sentence out loud is really quite incredible. I mean, Frank, the, the helmsman, Mao as the helmsman, the person who was leading the nation. I mean, the, the, the religiosity, of course, we know was was there from the beginning in terms of the way in which the Red Book and the and and the the kind of messianic way in which he galvanized the, the youth of the country in particular. Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, if you hear good old Chairman Mao speak, he's got a rather squeaky voice and a heavy Hunanese accent, so he's not exactly charismatic. And he tends to be on the chubby side, like dictators uh, tend to be, certainly towards the end. Um, but I, I think the key term is not so much religion and religiosity. They exterminate religion uh, ruthlessly, as Barbara pointed out. It's, it's, it's more like a cult. And not just any cult, cult of personality. And of course, not any personality, but cult of the dictator. I think that pervades the entire Mao era and, of course, uh, all the way till today, the People's Republic and other countries. Uh, and, and that, I think, is one of the um, consequences of a dictatorship. When you place all power in the hands of one particular individual, um, that individual must very much reign through fear, but you cannot put... A man with a gun or a woman with a gun behind every individual. So the cult of personality is really there to instill fear into each individual in the absence of others, where you might wake up uh, in sweat 
because you thought negatively about Chairman Mao, where you, where you might be afraid that your children uh, say something negative about the Communist Party and the chairman in, in particular, where you have to constantly demonstrate the loyalty, because that's what it's really all about. Uh, the whole Cultural Revolution is about every person demonstrating their absolute uh, undying loyalty, not to the party, but to the chairman himself. And, and that loyalty must be shown frequently by denouncing someone else, denouncing a relative or a neighbor or a colleague. Well, that, that makes his entire period so, 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 so extraordinary that you see images of, of, of red guards, you know, with the little red book who, who seem to be utterly under the spell of Chairman Mao. But once you approach all of this as a historian, you realize uh, dictators are great actors. Ordinary people are great actors too, and they know how to play this game and to create the illusion of consent and the illusion of loyalty. I just wanted to add one thing on this theme. I was very influenced um, by my late friend Fritz Stern, a great historian of Germany, partly because my editor then was married to him. Uh, but um, one of the things that he wrote a lot about very persuasively was national socialism as temptation. And I think one can get too much of an impression that this is all sort of top down, you know, that it doesn't rely on people actually being tempted to behave in transgressive ways. And that's why I also mentioned in the course of the book, George Orwell's uh, uh, writings about, you know, the, the attractions of the, the tribal Tom Tom beat. I mean, some people obviously got a big kick out of the nighttime rallies with the fires and all the rest of it and the music. It was obviously very... Uh, emotionally um, touching for them. So I think one has to remember that. And then secondly, the real objective reasons why societies or parts of societies are not resistant to this sort of um, hocus pocus. And, um, you know, they regard dictators as saviours uh, incredibly. I mean, I imagine that some people regard Donald Trump in that light, that you have to actually say, well, what was wrong with this? What pathologies were in societies uh, for people to turn to these preposterous figures? I mean, for God's sake, Hitler didn't even become a German citizen until 1932. He was an Austrian. I, I want to I want to talk about the way in which people responded. I mean, you're 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 talking about it a little bit, Michael. But I wonder, in the context of Barbara, your book, where you focus on the stories of of six people who. Um, a, a, you know, part of this group of people that you have interviewed, more than 100 people who defected, all from this one particular place in North Korea. And, and one of the things that comes out of your book at the end is that actually quite a lot of them struggle from having left and, and that there, there seems to be a suggestion that actually that if they don't miss being back in North Korea, that, that in some ways there is a certainty of having been there because they're so lost in the South. Uh, yes, that's absolutely the case. And it's you know no coincidence that so many North Korean defectors become evangelical Christians um, as soon as they leave the... Uh, well, North, North Korea had been very Christian before... Kim Il Sung. It was often called the the Jerusalem of Asia. Um, that that was Pyongyang. But people are so bereft when they leave North Korea. They realize very quickly that um, you know their entire lives were a lie. That's a, a quote um, that I've heard actually from several people. Everything I, I was ever taught um, from from school to my parents was a lie. So they they need to you know see something else to fill this vacuum and it's it's quite difficult and uh, emotionally they find um themselves you know often like you know wallowing in indecision when they get out of north korea just you know simple um questions of you know what to wear where to live um what to read what to watch um become overwhelming I wonder if I can get each of you to, to to just talk about the role that terror played in in the the regimes that you studied. I mean, F Frank, it's you, you've alluded to it a little bit, but just give us some of the details that resulted in forty five million people 
uh, being killed, the, the kinds of terror that people lived under? Well, the, 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 the terror in, in the sense of a, a gun behind your head is the early years of the regime, 49 to, you know, 52, 53. Of course, it continues. But what is so extraordinary about the Great Leap Forward is the uh, insistence of local cadres um, that human beings be treated very much like mere numbers on paper, not like human beings. Um, and the choices that people are reduced to having, having to, to make, a lot of textbooks when it comes to famine talk about broad abstractions and policy and this and that. But you've got to think about what it means for human beings on the ground. It's, it's frequently dismissed in a mere sentence, even in very, very, very big books on the history of modern China, you will get a mere sentence. But what does it mean, for instance, as I noticed um, in the archives, uh, for women who simply don't have enough food to feed all their children, they have to then decide which one to feed and which one to let starve. And occasionally some of them are unable to contemplate the, that choice and strap their children to their back and jump into a river. Or, or when you speak to a survivor who at the time was a young boy and was so hungry that he stole some of the food that belonged to his grandmother, uh, who dies of hunger a week later. And, and this by now old man has to live with that feeling of, of, of guilt. Uh, or, or the the real terror exercised by cows on the ground. For instance, when you steal, when a boy steals a potato, that boy is buried alive, and the father dies of grief a few days later. Well, that's the sort of environment in which you 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 live, in which hundreds of millions of people live from from fifty eight to to sixty one, in some cases sixty two. And, and Barbara, this, the secrecy that we associate with North Korea, the fact that we know so little about what happens in that country, is is mirrored in the relationship of of the of the two the two lovers in your book, where they they keep secrets from each other about wanting to defect, which is just so painful. Um, yes, the, the 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 love story in the book really reminded me a lot of. Um, you know this this wonderful short story about the man who buys a a comb for his wife and she cuts her hair to uh, to buy him a, a a watch band which he's then um, sold his watch but the um, you know there's the, this missed communication between people because you could not trust anybody in North Korea you couldn't trust your neighbors you couldn't trust your friends. I do think unlike China, you could trust members of your own family because of the whole system of collective punishment um, and family punishment. If one person in the family was um, you know, arrested for some thought crime, the entire family would be deported to the gulag. So you know, unless a, a child inadvertently blurted something out about their parent, um, the the family relations would stay intact. Um, and and I'd say contra just something um, that occurred to me listening to Frank speak. I don't think there was the same level of terror. There has been the same level of terror in North Korea because you're not talking about fifty eight to 61 Great Leap Forward or, um, you know, 66 to 76 Cultural Revolution. It's all been a continuum and people were so beaten down, so accustomed to being hungry, so weak that I don't think it occurred to them that they were going through some extraordinary change of policy. It was just, you know, all the time like that. And I think that that's why North Korea is a more complete dictatorship, which is there's, there's no change that would allow, you know, your consciousness to realize this is something extraordinary. This is just ordinary life. 
And Michael Burley, we, we, we are just because there is so much literature out there more familiar with the way in which uh, the Germans behaved under Nazi Germany. Just just reflect for us, if you if you will, on on the kind of terror, the role that terror played in, in, in those war years. Well, I think that one should not forget that the, you know, the rule of law continued on a, on a very selective basis. So if you had a dispute about ownership of a house or you wanted to get divorced, you know, providing you weren't Jewish, in which case you'd be outside the law, you wouldn't be able to even get to a court. But, you know, you'd, you'd get to a court and you'd get a judgment, even though they'd gradually pack the judiciary with their own sympathisers. But beyond that, starting off with rather modest enterprises outside cities, they built up a pan-European camp empire, which if you see it on a black map of Europe, is like looking at the Milky Way. There are so many little lights, which is a camp, just vast. And those camps, even though they were saturated with rules you know there were rules governing every aspect of your life the big truth about them is what the ss guard said to primo levy one day when he asked you know why was something happening he he got the reply there is no why here that's really it and i always think that um you know when one's talking about about uh, authoritarian and totalitarian regimes and i hope we come on to the authoritarians that um the key thing is what you see in that marvellous Russian movie, Leviathan, where if you're just a nobody, in that case a, a, a drunk who owns a clapperboard house on the Barents Sea, if you have the misfortune to own something that the local oligarch wants, he will use the entire resources of the state, the courts, the church, everything, to destroy your life so he can knock down your house and build his fancy condominium on it. And I think we're when we talk about human rights, often it's done in a rather abstract way, which the average person can't grasp. And you really do have to say to people, look, if you lived in this system, the rich and powerful would just get away with it every day of the week. And that's what happens under those regimes too. Well, well let's talk about that, the, the, the distinction between nationalist authoritarians and totalitarians. Michael, let's stay with you because, I mean, I suppose really the, the question is how useful is the, the political theorist Hannah Arendt's distinction between those two things? Well, no, I do, I do find that um, uh, because they, they don't really have the sort of eschatological vision, as it were, you know, which is literally world transforming. Um, I think, you know, I think, but in a way, looking at all these lurid dictatorships, which we're all doing, distracts from how, you know, people like Orban in Hungary, Modi in India, um, Erdogan in Turkey, there is a similar sort of assault on the freedom of the media. I mean, Modi's been doing it with the BBC, for heaven's sake, this week or last week. Um, and these things are very insidious. Um, the other thing they do is um, to... Um, you know, gradually interfere with the judiciary. They pack the judiciary, which certainly has been has been done in Hungary, uh, it's been done in Turkey, and it's being done on a monumental scale in Poland. And um, you know, sooner or later, you find you don't really have a recognisable rule of law anymore. And these things are very, very, very sinister. Never mind about Putin, which is a, on another level of malevolence entirely. But, but. You know, and these are all countries, incidentally, which still have democratic elections. You can vote in Russia, you can vote in Turkey, you can vote in Hungary, Poland, uh, but somehow or other, they've they've destroyed a lot of the the buttressing which makes these properly functioning democracies. And unfortunately, we're starting to see some of that here too. I, I wonder if if uh, Frank, either you or, or Barbara, want to want to reflect on on the, what, what Michael has just been talking about. That that there are there are these countries where ostensibly, I mean, in the case of Hungary and Poland, of course, they're part of the European Union, and and yet there are these um, these things that have been put in place that 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 shift what we all understand as the separation of powers and the rule of law. Well. You know, of course, that's the whole point about democracy. Eternal vigilance is necessary. Um, but none of these countries are anywhere near um, anything like North Korea or China. I mean, take uh, take good old Turkey. The head of the opposition was elected mayor of Istanbul. Can you see the head of the opposition uh, being mayor of Pyongyang or 
Beijing. I don't even know what the opposition would be in, in those two countries. Yeah, but at the same time, the head of the Kurdish Liberal Party, he's in prison. He won't be contesting the May, or May elections in Turkey. He's been in prison for the last two years. So, yes, there is, uh, you know, there will be an opposition candidate who may or may not be the mayor of Istanbul. But one of the big opposition parties, its leaders sitting in prison. It's not exactly the People's Republic of China. It's a little bit like saying that journalists get killed under Putin. No journalists get killed under People's Republic of China or in North Korea. Journalists yeah, are sure. state employees. Exactly. I mean, the very concept of a dissident does not exist in North Korea. And and I'd be interested to hear, Frank, what you think about, you know, of course, we now uh, talk about Xi Jinping in the context of the, the helmsman that now was because the cult of personality that he has created around him clearly has been a, a consciously manufactured uh, process. I mean, how how do you reflect on on the 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 similarities between the that idea of the cult of personality that Mao created and and Xi Jinping appears to be doing as well? Well, it, as I said, a cult of personality is, is is pretty much always a byproduct of a dictatorship, in that the key value is loyalty, and you foster loyalty and fear through a cult of personality. So it's not exactly um, surprising that Xi Jinping ha- has has a cult, as, by the way, had his predecessors, Chiang Zemin, uh, Hu Jintao, Deng Xiaoping, of course, although it, 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 it was um, explicitly um, criticised that there should not be any cult of personality, but in the end, it's still the same idea. You know, f- f- you... you admire and love the man who is guiding the nation, although you will never be able to vote him out. I think there's, a, um, if, I can, if I can jump in here, I think there's a key distinction, and I actually may be quoting you, Frank, is that um, Mao was uh, more of a manipulator who used chaos, uh, unleashing the cultural revolution for his own political aims, whereas um, I think she is, um, you know, really a control freak and you know his his fixation with control i mean is part it's part of the rigidity that has allowed the economy um to you know crumble during the zero zero covid um era i think Mao was much more and then that frank you can jump in here because this is your i was now much more um impulsive and um you know um, letting loose his whims on the population. Well, well yes and no. <laughs> I understand what you're trying to say. You're quite right. It was quite a personality. But you got to realize that what Mao did during the Cultural Revolution was, was quite unique in any dictatorship. When Kim Il sung looked on in sheer amazement, and, and, and so, so did the others. Uh, what he did is that he allowed ordinary people to criticize the very instrument that brought him to power, which was the party. But in the Cultural Revolution, ordinary people can take to task not just a local carver, but a top-ranking minister all the way in Beijing. Uh, in other words, Mao used the people to purge the party, uh, which, again, was quite extraordinary. Of course, then he brought in the army to purge the people, <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, he purged the army too. <laughs> so, but, but that was quite a quite a you know a unique sort of uh, event but you're quite right he used the cultural revolution to pretty much uh, thrive in chaos occasionally rescue a loyal follower and you know throw to the dogs anyone who he suspected of being a real or even imagined enemy whereas uh, the regime we have today is, is much more um, traditional shall we say I I wonder if I can uh, ask all of you, really, as we draw this conversation to a close, to to, to reflect on on what lessons can be learned from uh, each of the areas that you have focused on in in, in the books that won this prize, in, in, in terms of trying to stop the rise of dictatorships now? I mean, what is it in your books that, that are give us some lessons, if you like, um, 
Barbara, I mean, it's it's quite clear that not that much has changed in North Korea, um, but but it's possible that you can tell us that actually quite a lot of things have changed. Well, I, I think in in terms of North Korea, the key element is information. Um, North Koreans, um, you know, are very clever people, and they will seize on any any you know particle of light that penetrates you know this this curtain over north korea and in in my you know talks with north korean defectors i just heard these amazing stories they were always my favorite you know somebody who was a north korean soldier who got a um a gift of a nail clipper and it was made in the u.s and he realized um oh my god if they can make this kind of nail clipper um, North Korean defectors who go to China and they watch um, television and they see um, an advertisement for a, um, a you know a refrigerator, a flat screen TV, a, a rice cooker, um, you know, are just amazed by what's in the outside world. Um, and I mean, North Korea is an extreme case, but you know, I would say information is the the, the key element. And is that the case, Frank, also in contemporary China? I mean, we saw those demonstrations against the zero COVID policy, which which did in some cases morph into uh, a, a, a different kind of protest against Xi Jinping, which was unusual, if not as widespread as, as the West would like to would like to see it. Well, it illustrates how these regimes, which are supposed to be incredibly stable and plan everything, uh, are characterized by a complete lack of planning in many cases on, on the ground and will change course completely, sometimes on a mere whim, in order to survive. And that's, I think, very much what happened a few months ago, a uh, shift away from a, a harsh zero COVID policy, people locked up in big cities, not just countryside, big cities for months on end, and then turn about as if nothing happened, no preparation, certainly not enough preparation in hospitals. Um, Just let everyone do whatever they want, and if they get it, so be it. Uh, I think that that is what is so characteristic also of of dictatorships, these extraordinary sort of changes in uh, in, in, in the whole way, again, it goes back to the Cultural Revolution, it's something utterly unpredictable, completely unpredictable. Michael Burley, let's end with you. I mean, I, I wonder if you will just um, reflect for us on the legacies of, of Nazism. When you look at the, the rise of xenophobia and racism and, mm. and moral corruption in, in so many different pockets, not just in Europe, but, but in other parts of the world, do, do you yeah. see that as a kind of, do you see that a direct connection between what we're seeing today in terms of those three things that I've mentioned and the legacies legacies of, of the Third Reich. Okay, well, um, the, the objective I had when I was writing the book, I failed at dismally because it was only last month that I met one reader upon whom the book had had its effect. He was a retired civil servant of some seniority, and he said he'd bought the book in 2000, but he'd only he'd put it down halfway through because he felt sort of contaminated or sort of sordid by it. And I thought, yes, finally, 20 years later, result. Because the whole point of my book is to say that every single individual in that regime that I was writing about, they're not fascinating, they're just squalid characters with crazy views. They created nothing except death, destruction and ruination, including the ruination of Germany for a few years. So there is just nothing. And in fact, I'd go a bit further than that. I'd say that a lot of the literature and certainly all the television programmes which are churned out for people to watch when they come back drunk from the pub, um, they ought to have the equivalent of a health warning on a packet of cigarettes or on a bottle of wine, you know, because this is dangerous stuff. And it's also dangerous because it distracts us from what's going on in the present, which you just alluded to, which is the very insidious destruction of our rights, like attempts to circumscribe, limit, abolish public protest, uh, the takeover of our media by tax exiles, non-doms and foreigners, um, attempts to constrain the rule of law. I mean, this country is actually apparently considering leaving the European Convention on Human Rights, which would put us in the company of Belarus and Russia, for God's sake. 
So I think it, in a way we need to think less. I'm just talking about what I do, not the real existing dictatorships in China or in North Korea, but where I, where I am right now in Europe, uh, we ought to be much more sensitive to what's going on in our own political cultures because we could wake up one day and find the bridge we're crossing on our train every day has been transformed too, not with concentration camps and the rest of it, but in ways we won't find very congenial. What a sobering thought on which to end. Uh, Michael Burley, thank you very much. Barbara Demick and Frank Decotta, thank you all three for taking time to talk to us today. We'd like to also thank the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its generous support for this podcast. And to find out more about the Bailey Gifford Prize, you can visit the website or follow us on Twitter at BG Prize. Tune in next time to hear more about the last 25 years of nonfiction. Until then, bye-bye. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.